The back half of the hockey season is well underway. Scores! For some, that means thoughts of the immediate, conference championships, and maybe more. For others, it's a look into the future. Uncertain at the moment, but it may become clear by the early days of summer. Welcome to New England Hockey Journal. I'm Evan Marinovsky. The calendar still says winter, but you can bet that a talented collection of hockey players, both in New England and nationwide, have their sights set on late June, when the NHL draft is held in Las Vegas. A year ago, we saw two New England kids, now in their freshman seasons at Boston College, taken in round one of the draft, Will Smith and Ryan Leonard. This year, for months now, much of the talk has focused on a 17-year-old, not a local kid, but one who plays locally. Vancouver native Macklin Celebrini is in his freshman season at Boston University. He currently is in the top 10 in scoring nationwide, which is not bad for a player who doesn't turn 18 until mid-June. With that, let's talk the NHL draft. With us is Dave Gregory from NHL Central Scouting. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Of course, of course. And Dave, we're here to break down our top 10 list of New England kids eligible to be drafted in June. But before we dive in, I'm curious your take on Macklin Celebrini. This kid appears to be the total package. Yeah, we've we've known that for a couple of years now. He's uh, he's thrived at whatever level he's played at. He's always played sort of at a, at a higher level than his age, and he's never taken a step back. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that he's probably been the youngest player in every game he's played in this year and most times the best player so pretty fun to watch and he just continues to impress every time he goes out there that's exactly it he keeps impressing and uh, as we move along here to the top 10 kids locally we think who may be taken in the draft let's start at number 10 and work our way up and at number 10 we have geo de julian a six foot one right wing playing this year at kent dave what do you think of geo de julian well, he's been a fun player to watch his progress as well. Um, very good skater who can dictate the pace of play, but shows a lot of intelligence, especially when he enters the attacking zone. Keeps his head up, sees opportunities. He's been really good at trying to dictate the pace of play in his games, and I think it's going to translate well as he progresses in his career, takes that step to college, and then onward, hopefully in his case, uh, to have a pro career. And with someone like DeJulian, he stayed at Kent for his senior year. What's your take? I mean, that's something we're always discussing around here is, do you go to juniors for your senior year? Do you stay at prep? How do you think that could impact Gio DeJulian and kind of his development staying in prep? Well, I, I get that question a lot. Um, and over my career, it's, it's um, to me, you should go where you're going to thrive and where you're going to play your best hockey. Um, you know, as scouts, we'd love it to be easy, but sometimes you got to project more and a player staying in a prep school as opposed to going to junior may mean there's more projection, may mean the development path is a little bit longer, but hey, that's our job. We got to figure it out. And it's tough sometimes for team scouts to sort of put their name on the line and say, hey, I, I think we should draft this player, even though he's at this stage of his career. But um, there's definitely players out there that fit that bill. And it's, it's the job of scouts to find out who they are. Moving along at number nine, we have Ethan Gardula, a native of Princeton, Mass, who played his prep school hockey at Cushing and now in the USHL with Sioux City. And Dave, this is someone who was eligible to be drafted last year. Where do you see his stock fitting in this year? Well, obviously, Ethan had a great career at Cushing and, and was a prospect that we were tracking last year. Um, but sometimes a player that's in that situation uh, gets passed up because it's, it's difficult to project how they'll play at the next level. I think with Ethan showing what he's doing this year in the USHL, his game is progressing. He's showing that yes, he can adapt to a quicker game and with time and space taken away from him, his game has grown. So I think there's a very good chance that teams are gonna reconsider what they wanna do with him and that he may have a chance to get picked and, and play from there. We're just getting started here on the Hockey Journal. More when we return. New England Hockey Journal's Rinkwise podcast, hosted by Stephanie Wood and me, Evan Marinovsky, is the hockey podcast for serious hockey players and their supporters to help guide them throughout their hockey careers with interviews and insight from some of the biggest names in the game. 
Download RinkWise today wherever you get your podcasts or listen at HockeyJournal.com backslash podcast. New England Hockey Journal is brought to you by Bando Performance, using the latest scientific research to push athletes to reach their full potential. Hey guys, Charlie Bando here with Bando Performance, and today we're talking about force plates. For those of you that don't know what force plates are, I'm here to tell you. Force plates are unique in the sense where we can go into each athlete's individual profile and see how much force that they're developing from the ground all the way up from a functional athletic standpoint. What are we measuring, you may ask? We're measuring a lot of different things. It depends the test. With our counter movement test, or AKA for most of you viewers, our vertical jump, we have our hands on our hips and all that we're trying to look at is how high can the athlete jump how much force are they jumping with, and their breaking force of which they're jumping with, which then tells us how strong an athlete is at absorbing force and transferring that force efficiently. With our multi-rebound jump, we're looking at a statistic called reactive strength index. The higher the reactive strength index number, the better the athlete is at producing forces from the ground all the way up to the playing surface. With our mid-thigh isometric pull, go! We're looking for how much force an athlete can produce into the ground. And relax. We want each athlete to be neurologically sound so that they can produce efficient force in a timely manner, which is critical for on-ice performance and injury reduction. What do we do with this data, you may ask? Each individual has a profile that syncs to our cloud system from the force plates. And from that cloud system, we can better see trends in an athlete's performance, whether or not they're jumping higher throughout the course of a phase, or they're getting weaker from an isometric mid-thigh or strength standpoint, and then we can better utilize what that athlete needs to really ensure development from not only a physical side of things, but reduce the risk of injury as well. Now, utilizing force plates is just one of the many different offerings that we have. If you'd like to find out more information about what we have to offer, we have three locations in Woburn, Dedham, and Worcester, Massachusetts. Or you can visit us on our website at bando-performance.com so that we can take your game to the next level. We're back here on the Journal talking NHL draft and the local products who could be chosen come the June draft in Vegas. We're back with the NHL Central Scouting, Dave Gregory. Dave, let's resume now at number eight, Owen Keefe, Saugus Mass native, Malden Catholic, now with Sioux City of the USHL. Well, Owen has shown that he can adapt to uh, playing at the level in the USHL. Um, He's a player that competes hard, which is a major element of what you need to advance your hockey career. He's less risk and more reward than he was maybe earlier in his career. And I don't say that negatively in that uh, someone who's willing to take risks and make plays is always interesting to scouts in that, okay, can we get that happening at the next level in the right situation and not turn a puck over or something like that, where I think his adaptation at the level he's at has shown that there's something there with him he's got a good path on where he's going to go at the next level and um, has NHL qualities to his game that I think will get him some serious consideration come the draft time. Uh, the other thing with Owen that I think is very interesting is he came right out of the MIAA to the USHL that's sort of a path that doesn't happen much anymore right Dave? Yeah that's that's so true um, obviously over the years the the paths change and what is the best way to advance your career and like we talked about earlier there's there's no perfect path you have to go where you're going to advance your game the best and feel most comfortable playing i i think he knew having uh, a hockey dad and a dad with the experience that he has you know he was ready for this step and uh, he's proven that that's the case and moving along to number seven is a player who had a successful showing at avon old farms won an elite eight title amherst new hampshire native Joe Connor now playing with Muskegon in the USHL and he's someone again like Gardula was eligible last year didn't get picked now it seems like he's tearing up the USHL and it's improving his draft stock. Yeah no question about it and um, our group always really liked Joe I thought he was uh, a likely draft last year there's one thing you never miss with Joe his compete level is always there but he combines that with skill and hockey sense and I think he's uh, on a mission to say hey I would have been a good pick last year, so maybe you should take me this year. And he's someone 5'10", 174. I know size kind of comes into play with a lot of these NHL teams. Uh, do you see that potentially being an issue this year, or is his compete and his production level at the USHL kind of put that to bed? 
Well, there's always going to be those that uh, the size question comes up. Like it's, it's uh, you know, the old adage, the big guy's got to prove he can't, the smaller guy's got to prove he can. The way he plays his game, he's playing against bigger and stronger players this year and showing that it's not slowing him down. So um, I don't think it's going to be an issue with him and whether the teams think that, we'll find out come draft day. And our player at number six could potentially be the most debatable on the list. Vermont native Caden Harrington, 6'1 defenseman playing at Holderness. Some say he'll be selected. Others say his hockey sense and foot speed might not be quite where it needs to be. Uh, what's your take on Caden Harrington? Well, I, again, I think it all turns to development and the, where you're playing and where each part of your game is at. And I think with... Caden, it's it's a matter of okay, he's he's playing in a in a school that traditionally doesn't produce a lot of draft picks necessarily, um, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. I think he's got elite offensive sense, and I think there's something there that teams are going to consider highly. And he feels like someone, and you mentioned it a little bit there, the dynamic uh, ability, uh, offensive ability he has. Uh, seems like someone with his size plus, you know, his offensive abilities, someone that could really potentially be a real player at the next level, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we've talked about size issues uh, with some other players here, but that's not that's not a, that the case with Caden. So now it's a matter of do all the other skills come together and the, can this package be advancing in his hockey career and go to the next level and the next level and eventually be a pro. I think he does enough when you watch him play that he's going to have people still talk about him right to the to draft day. New England Hockey Journal rolls on after this. As we go to break, here are two other local hopefuls to keep our eyes on. Back here on New England Hockey Journal, I'm Evan Marinovsky, and we're discussing which players from the local area could be selected in June's NHL draft. Our discussion continues with the NHL Central Scouting's Dave Gregory. Dave, we've made it halfway through our top 10 list, and coming in at number five is Holden Mass native Will Felicio playing this year in the USHL. Will impressed even last year as a what we call an underage player in the USHL. It's, it's real clear the hockey sense and the skill that this player has. He can dictate the pace of play. He can rush the puck or he can slow it down and look for the open man. He, he really brings to the table that puck moving defenseman that uh, a lot of teams are looking for. And is this someone who could run my power play? Is this someone that's gonna be a defensive zone exit machine? So he brings those skills with his smarts and his elusiveness on, on his edges that um, he, he's the kind of player that teams are looking for. Now, Felicio is on the smaller side, about 5'10", 161, but Dave, you mentioned just his offensive abilities. What's your take on, at the NHL level, smaller defensemen in today's game uh, with offensive ability? Where is their uh, sort of place in today's NHL? Well, there's definitely a place, and it, it's just a matter of are you the smaller player that's going to be able to overcome size issues? Like, that's just the reality. You know, you you have an opportunity coming out of the USHL. You go play college. You have time to hone your game and find out if you can play against bigger, stronger, faster players. And at number four on our list, Elliot Greenwald, Bellows Falls, Vermont native, plays this year in the USHL with Cedar Rapids. Dave, this is a guy, 6'2", 201, reliable shutdown defenseman. He feels like someone that uh, you can kind of maybe easily project uh, to work at the pro level. Right. I, I think he's done a very good job of showing that his game translates well. Um, he has that size and strength, but he also moves very effectively, both with and without the puck. Um, I love his puck retrieval. I love how he exits the zone and doesn't just throw it off the boards. If there's a passing opportunity, it's there. And if he can carry the puck out, he'll do it as well. You know, we talk about analytics a lot now these days. It, is, it doesn't mean you have to be on the score sheet, but you're contributing to your team creating offense and scoring. So I think that's where he fits in. And um, I think he's got a path to the NHL. And one thing, it's funny, Dave, when I was at USA Hockey Select 17 camp last year, I, his stick is so good in the defensive zone. You know, you mentioned maybe the, the scoring not being there, but I just feel like the shutdown abilities in his own zone make up for that completely, right? Right. And, and a good stick, you make a good point, a good stick relates to hockey sense in, in my experience. Like, 
positioning your stick and being deceiving with how you may intercept pucks or steal pucks or or stop a rush and he's very effective at doing that and that's something that it, it, the game is not always banging and crashing and taking a puck away by being overly physical it's being smart with your positioning it's being smart with your stick and then transitioning the other way who remains on our top 10 list of local players hoping to be drafted this summer we'll answer that after this break when new england hockey journal continues Back here on the Hockey Journal with the NHL Central Scouting's Dave Gregory, we have three more players on our list of those local kids hoping to hear their name on draft day. And starting at number three, it's Ben Merrill. Big kid, six foot four center, native of Hingham, Massachusetts, playing this year at St. Sebastian's. Dave, what have you thought of his game so far? Well, Ben uh, obviously is a player we've noticed for a while. And to see his improvement from last year to this year, um, obviously, young people grow at different times in their life and he got big and he's adapted and his skating has gotten better as he's uh, progressed through last year and this year. So he's an NHL package when you look at his size and the way he can shoot and move the puck that he's um, going to be someone that teams are going to be very interested in. And he feels like someone with a high ceiling, big guy, great skill, someone that I feel like could be a middle round player. Would I be correct in that assessment, Dave? Well, I, I think with a player coming out again, we talked about where a player is at in their career. He's playing in prep school during his, his uh, draft year. There's gonna be some teams that are gonna wanna see more. So it's, it's, it's never a guarantee where someone will go, obviously, but he does have the package. We're projecting down the road here. He's got a lot of hockey ahead of him, but there's pro attributes there. There's someone I can see on an NHL rink one day. Absolutely. There have been some plays I've seen him make this year at St. Sebastian's that just leave me completely uh, struck by how good of a play it was. Uh, and moving right along, two to go now. And at number two, Sudbury Mass native Teddy Stiga played his prep hockey at Belmont Hill, went on to the NTDP, playing uh, as a U18 on this team uh, with James Hagens. Dave, what have you thought of Teddy Stiga this season? Uh, nothing but positive things. I love Teddy's game. Every time I see him, he brings it. Um, he's contributing one way or another. Very elite with the puck on his stick, finding teammates and a deceivingly quick release and shot that uh, makes him a point producer. So um, you, you put that with a, a player that can play at any pace and he's going to be attractive uh, to NHL clubs without a doubt. And I think what makes Stiga fascinating is last season with the U-17 team was not his best year. He dealt with injuries, but he spent that time getting stronger, putting on muscle weight. And I think you're seeing that pay off this year, right? Yeah, no question about it. And you hit on something there that over my career I've seen there. You see players that have this part of this package that you need and are missing something else. And eventually a player, quote unquote, gets it. He's proven that whether it's against NCAA teams, uh, whether it's against uh, USHL teams and, and going into tournaments, he's, he's going to be a factor every game. And finally, moving right along to our number one player locally, a shoe in to be drafted. It's just a question of where will he go in the first round. Scoring machine Cole Iserman. Dave, what do you make of Cole Iserman's season this year? Well, there's uh, a lot to like about Cole. Um, we talk about Cole a lot with our group, and, and obviously he's uh, high on our list at midterm, someone that we know is going to go in the first round, and like you said, it's just a matter of where. Um, such an elite goal-scoring ability, and obviously you need to score goals. And uh, you could see a GM sitting around the draft table looking at uh, his scouts and his uh, assistant GM saying, why aren't we taking the guy that scored 60 goals this year? Um, I think we better consider that. So. Goal scoring is always at a premium, uh, and Cole wants to score, he drives to score, and he's always going to score. He's done it at every level. And you mentioned the goal scoring with Eisenman. It's his number one attribute. When it comes to first round talent, guys that uh, are just surefire picks in the first round, this is gonna sound kind of crazy, but how important is scoring being the number one attribute? I mean, how much can that improve someone's draft stock? It improve it tremendously. Um, you need someone who can finish uh, and whether you're contributing to the goal by setting it up or finishing the goal, it's always important that you have someone that's going to be that for you. We talk about 
top line players, top six players. It's a key element to the game. It's always going to be a key element to the game. And if you have that ability, you're going to be highly sought after. So Dave, as we wrap up here, we have our top 10. When it comes to the New England draft talent, uh, I'm not going to ask how many of these kids get picked, but what's your sense on uh, the feelings around these players? I mean, is it going to be a good year for New England in the draft? Is it going to be a down year? I mean, where are you at with that? I think there's enough talent in the New England area that there's going to be players that we're looking back at down the road three, four, five years from now saying, yeah, that was that was a pretty deep time in uh, in New England. And I think there's players maybe we didn't even mention, that always happens. Um, players, quote unquote, like we said earlier, get it at different times and develop at different pace. So I'm an optimist when it comes to hockey players. I see how great the game has progressed, how, me how much more talent there is, how much better players are at the development stage, even in prep school. And um, I'm confident there'll be some very good players that come out of the draft from this area. Well, Dave, I am also an optimist. And Dave, we really appreciate you taking the time here to talk with us today. No, my pleasure anytime. And thanks for doing this, guys. That's it. Our look at the local players who hope to hear their name called at the NHL draft late June in Las Vegas. I'm Evan Marinofsky. See you next time on New England Hockey Journal. New England Hockey Journal is brought to you by Bando Performance, using the latest scientific research to push athletes to reach their full potential.